You can see that actually the number of people with diarrhea on any one week numbers in the hundreds. So anywhere from 400 to 600 is the number of, uh, of people with diarrhea. And this is the number of people with diarrhea who go to the polyclinic. It does not include all those going to the private GPs. Right, and polyclinic is roughly one in five. So you should yes. multiply that roughly by five. That's right. So you're talking about maybe four, five hundred every day people having diarrhea. Correct. Is food poisoning the only reason for diarrhea? Uh, food poisoning is not the only reason for diarrhea. Um, but uh, the, obviously, if you take too much laxatives, you're going to get diarrhea as well. But it is a major cause, right? So, but it will be yes. a major cause. So after what you just told us about uh, doing, staying at home and doing it ourselves, your GPs are going to lose a lot of business because now we know what to do. <laughs> I'm going to uh, turn to Louis and ask him. We've been hearing a lot... Uh, well, in the papers lately about how there's shortage in labour, uh, especially in the uh, food industry and things like that. Does that lead to shortcuts? Are we going to see in future, because of the shortage of labour, uh, greater risk to, uh, to people? I think we are not shortage of labour. We are control. <laughs> Okay, okay, so we are controlled. So we, we still are, don't have enough are, people. We don't have enough people. I mean, uh, the FMB industry, uh, I think everywhere is shortage of people. Uh, because most of the Singaporeans, they don't want to work in the FMB. I must say, I don't know whether there's FMB or chef here. Yeah. Uh, one thing we have to do in the kitchen is not, not shortcut. We, we can't afford to do shortcut, especially uh, food safety. Yeah. Uh, of course, with the help of supplier, that we can purchase some of the items is already uh, ready. Uh, example, uh, stock or sauce, some of it, or, or, or pastry item that will help us to for the preparation. Actually, our worry really is not all these top class restaurants, etc. I think we generally feel that you people have very good standards. What about hawker centres, right? You sometimes see the hawker, so they all wear gloves and then they cut the food. Then you pay the person, the person takes the money and then counts out the change and gives it back to you. How hygienic is that? Who would like to take that question? I often eat at a hawker centre. <laughs> yeah, when I see, when I buy a packet of chicken rice, uh, the man will use a glove, chop the chicken, then after that, you take, take, the, take the glove away, then you collect the money from you and put back the glove and continue to chop again. I tell myself, wow, he's been using the glove for the whole days. Uh, because you want to save. At least you took out the glove cent, before touching your money. You know, some people don't uh, even take out their gloves. Some don't, yeah, some don't. And they use the same cloth, clean the chopping board the whole day. Can you imagine? So uh, why are we why are not more of us sick? We are already immune. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We eat chicken rice if it's just not fully cooked. We have no problem. If you ask a tourist come, they need chicken rice, maybe they will get food poisoning. Why? Because it's not fully cooked? Yes. Is that, is that true, Dr. Lee? Um, okay, so a few reasons. One is that, um, you know, we always talk about too much acid in our stomach. Actually, uh, the stomach is very acidic for a reason. When all the, <laughs> when all the bacteria hits our stomach and our stomach is very acidic, uh, the acid is meant to kill uh, the bacteria. So that's actually one of the That is one of the first lines of defense that uh, there is um, acid there. Um, part of it is also true that uh, whether or not we have, um, well, whether or not our, our own gut immunity has um, been trained. Um, to, to, to handle the bacteria that is in, our, in, in circulation here. Uh, so just like Louis says that the tourists coming here uh, eat chicken rice may also have problems. It's just like when we go to Indonesia, we go and eat the street food in Jakarta, we will also kena the diarrhea down there. But you, you see everyone, the Indonesians eating the street food in Jakarta also don't come down with diarrhea, right? It's because um, their gut immune system has been trained. Ah, which leads to the other question. 
should we uh, sterilize our children the way we do or should we let them just go around and eat everything because does that build their immunity so well that in future they will be uh, less likely to get food poisoning? Uh, well, it depends on your philosophy on child rearing. But, <laughs> but yes, you, you do need to train the immune system a bit because if the immune system has never met uh, a virus or a bacterium before, you are not it, it takes more time for the immune system to ramp up the first time that it meets that particular bacterium. Now, can I turn to Hui Ling and ask you, you know, you do uh, food chain, uh, cold chain, etc. How, how food should be preserved? What are the main viruses or bacteria that you protect uh, these food against? What are you most concerned about? Um, actually, for the cold chain management standard, they look across all the bacteria and virus. So maybe just to share a few of... So right from the product is... Um, is because every product will have perishability, and right from the origin to the distribution, all kinds of products that are supposed to be kept in a deep freeze condition, frozen condition, up to the normal chill temperature, has to be kept at the correct temperature. And that is because we are actually, when, when we talk about cold chain management, we are actually looking across all, mitigate the risk factors from all the viruses and bacteria that might be co potentially contaminating the food. So if that helps to answer the questions, and the next slide actually just shows that um, what types of, what types of uh, produce are actually located at a specific temperature range. Can, can you go back to that one again? Right, so even oranges, you are saying I should... Keep it coffee, at the correct... also I should keep in the fridge. Yes, uh, keep it at the correct temperature, about 5 to 10. That is to ensure the optimum shelf life. Can you people see any of this? Yeah. Uh, if I can compare oranges, like optimum shelf life is about 21 to 90 days. If you are able to keep it about um, at the temperature range of about 7 degrees Celsius, it will ensure that it will be stored at that. Uh, it, so will be, it will be kept fresh from 21 to 90 days. Yeah, that's I was all. just about to ask you about the range. So it says fresh meat, beef, lamb, pork and poultry. If you keep it at minus 2 degrees, the shelf life is 14 to 65 days. That's 2 weeks to 2 months. Why that big difference? Because of the size, the volume, the portion and the cut. So That's what keeps the best? Sorry? What keeps best? Safe at home, right? So I, I, I cheapskate, right? So I go to a wholesaler, then I buy plenty, then I go and put it in my freezer. How long can I keep it and how should I keep it? Um, okay, this is, I must, I must cautious that this is about industrial size. So if you, talk, if you take it down to consumer consumption level and quantity, I would imagine uh, a medium size that you can get from the supermarket or... Say one chicken or a slice of steak, right? Sometimes yeah. uh, supermarkets got a special offer. You buy two, you get it cheaper. So I don't want to eat two chicken the same day, right? So I can keep some in the freezer. Then maybe... I thought, uh, very cheap, huh? maybe I buy four chicken. Then I buy four chicken and put it in the freezer. How long can I safely keep it? Sa um, my experience is, based on what I know, is about two weeks. I, I, I guess I leave it to the chef. What is your... <laughs> because you deal more with... Maybe you can comment. Anything then? If it's in the freezer? How long is it safe to keep my meat in the freezer and then take it out to cook? Okay, before I answer this question. Okay. You buy two chicken. Right? You can't finish, so you keep one in the freezer. So the next time you want to eat, you defrost it. Then right? I forget that chicken, I go and you buy it because it. on sale again, you see. Then you, decide, you decided that I want to eat half a chicken only, but I defrost the whole chicken. So defrost the whole chicken and the half chicken back into the freezer again. Is that correct? Which is not supposed to be done, right? <laughs> From what he says. Yeah, uh, if you are defrost, it's not supposed to be refreeze again. Yeah. What happens if I defrost, I cut it in half, and then I refreeze? I mean, it's not very long, right? I defreeze, I cut it in half, I put it back. Very fast, right? What's wrong with that? No, in, in food preparation, we're not supposed to be 
defrost and defreeze. And because of that, you get uh, bacteria grow because the temperature went, went, went up. So that's the time the bacteria grow. Yeah, and but you refreeze It doesn't take a long time for the bacteria in the air to just attack the food outside. How long does it take? See, if I defreeze it in my, in my microwave, right? So very fast, a few minutes, it's that's defrosted. Worse. I go and, uh, Almost that's instantaneous, worse. because imagine every, all the air that you are currently breathing and the space you're occupying is infected. We, there's bacteria, there's definitely bacteria in the air that we are breathing. So right at the point whereby the food is exposed to the ambient condition, the, the risk is already there. So it's like, like what Louis say, almost instantaneous. So, so back to the question, how long you can keep your, your meat or poultry yeah. in the freezer? Uh, I have no idea actually. <laughs> no, uh, a few months is, is okay. But I think the shorter time is better. Yeah, depend uh, when, when you freeze it, you know. I think uh, one or two months is fine and the temperature must be below minus 18. Well, most freezers are, well, cold, right? Minus 18. Minus 18. Are they all standard minus 18? Because some of them you can make it even colder. And I, some... put, I set it at minus 20. Okay, so the, the colder, colder the, the better. better. Yeah. Right. Like and tuna, you can fish, they, your... tuna fish, they keep it at minus 40. I think Dr. Ling was talking about the recent recall of tuna. Yes. What about uh, the fish and the poultry that we get from the uh, wet market? Uh, it's chill. What's the difference between frozen and chill? Just go back to the slide. Frozen is about about minus 18. Chill is between 0 to 4, usually. Yeah, that's the difference. And if you are getting something that is um, like from the fresh food market or the, the, the wet, market. Wet, wet market, we we'll usually put it at the chiller. The bottom, uh, now, nowadays, the fridge can be up. Top and bottom is the same. As long as you, I mean, as in, there's no... If you look at the traditional fridge, the bottom compartment is usually the chiller compartment, whereas the upper compartment is the freezer compartment. But nowadays, there's inverter, inverter technology. So basically, you need to know which, which compartment is the freezer compartment and put your frozen... Let's say you, are get, you went to a NTUC or Giant and you bought a whole turkey that is frozen, then probably that you have to put it in the freezer compartment. Yeah. Then the, the thing is this, this wet market, whatever they haven't sold, they will keep. And then the they, will sell it, they will sell it the following day or maybe if it's a weekend, and Monday they close, then it comes out on Tuesday. Uh, Actually, that's a good question because I also noticed some supermarkets, they take their, uh, their fish and some of the, even the chicken, say, chicken thighs, they say freshly thawed. So, from what Louis tells us, it's already been frozen, then it's thawed, you bring it home, can I then put it back into the freezer or what happens? Yeah. No, no, in the case of wet market, it's usually they are off on Monday. So, whatever is uh, left over on Sunday, I, I don't know how they keep it and I believe they, they, they resell it on, Monday, uh, on Tuesday. How safe are those? But I think if they store in the chiller at the temperature below 5 degrees, that's fine, right? I think the best is don't, don't go to the wet market on Tuesday. <laughs> Anybody else has a question you want to ask? Yes? Uh, just like to find out, beside viruses and bacteria, are there food poisoning due to other type of maybe like chemicals? First question. Second is like, for example, those cruise ship. You always heard about hundreds of people died, um, not died, but sick uh, due to the Nova virus. Norovirus. Uh, so how is it because through food or through air? Dr. Ling, would you like to take that one? Okay, if we were to take the second question first, then the uh, cruise ship. Well, actually not just cruise ships, but any place where you have got almost like captive audience. So whether it's cruise ships, army camps, 
uh, where you are forced to eat only in certain places where there's a fixed kitchen, a fixed cookhouse, then these are the ones where uh, they are where, where you're prone to outbreaks of foodborne problems. So all you need is for someone in your kitchen to have come down, whether it's norovirus or rotavirus, and then if that person contaminates uh, the kitchen, then you're going to have a problem. Uh, we also have outbreaks in uh, military camps, not just in Singapore, but all over the world. The, um, and of course, it's not just the uh, people in the kitchen who can contaminate the food on cruise ships. Passengers can also contaminate the food uh, because or, or, you know, you, if someone has norovirus, um, uh, food poisoning, and then uh, went to the toilet, never washed hands properly, after that went to the dining room, um, it's a buffet, you pick up a ladle, you, then the next person come along, pick up the same ladle, don't know that the other person never washed hands properly, and that's how the norovirus is passed along. Um, and, and that's why on cruise ships, uh, they are actually quite paranoid about this hygiene in the dining halls. Um, the, but yes, despite all, the, uh, despite all that they do, uh, sometimes there will still be outbreaks. How, how easy is it for, you know, it sounds uh, like science fiction, right? I touch this, I touch the ladle, you touch the ladle, I, and then you get sick. But how, much, how many viruses and bacteria do you pass on at that rate, you know? And does that mean that after the next person touches it, the handle is now clean? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so, but, the, but honestly, I cannot answer that question. But does it take a very little or does it take a lot of bacteria to cause uh, food poisoning? It actually... Um, okay, then again, it depends on the individual bacterium, it depends on the individual virus, and then again, it depends on the individual person. Um, the, so someone who has got, let's say, for some reason, you have, uh, there's not that much acid in your stomach, and therefore you're not able to sterilize the food coming in that well, then you need a lower amount of bacterium or bugs to come in before you overwhelm your defences and therefore cause food poisoning in you. Yes, uh, the gentleman here. Who has got the microphone? Ah, please. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, it's very interesting conversation going on the lines of food poisoning and the clinical aspects. But there is more to the food safety than just food poisoning. My first priority is that since we don't produce much food in Singapore and practically everything is imported, are we importing trouble along with the food? Uh, not just in terms of, I mean, we, have, we keep hearing that no chicken from Selangor Valley is to be imported in Singapore or there are other instances as well. And second point is that it's not just food poisoning that we might be interested. We might be interested, for example, anything coming from China, we always say that, okay, does it contain benzene? Does it contain, I mean, I, it contains everything except what we are looking for. So, how secure are we in Singapore with respect to our sources of food? Thank you. Right. Uh, Huiling, would you like to attempt that? Or shall we just tell them that the NEA and the AVA do regular testing? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not from a government. I'm not from NEA or AVA. I may not be uh, the right person to address this, but I, like what Selma has mentioned, um, if we look at the, what we can read from the main media, there's always check and inspection and balance at the custom checkpoints. And even before they bring in the, because of the government strategy to um, diversify sources, right, so that we can have a sustainable chain of um, food, food um, imports to Singapore for, for our own needs and supplies. There are, there's, NEA and AVA do run regular samples to make sure that these food producers are up to a certain standard and um, hygiene in order before they can bring them in. So I, I guess as consumer, we, can, we, we just have to have the trust and faith that um, things that are brought in most of the time are safe for com consumption, but when it comes to our own preparation and handling, what we can do is just to make sure that we follow the due diligence and instructions given on the food packages. 
Yes, you're right about chicken. We, we don't bring in chicken and pork from Malaysia, no chicken or duck from Hong Kong because of bird flu. But could I then ask you, you know, sometimes your, your canned food, right, there's an expiry date, and then sometimes the can bloats a little bit. And we're always told when the can starts bulging, you shouldn't eat uh, what's inside. What happens when the can bulges? What's, what <coughs> happens inside the can? Is it... Uh, party inside. What is the inside? bacteria party. <laughs> the bacteria are having a party inside. Yes. But it's a can. How do, how do the bacteria get inside? How, do, how does the can bloat and how, how do these things happen? That's such a gentleman. I thought he was going to answer it, then he passes it to her. I thought I was going to answer it until I can't expire. If it's over expiry date, because every food item will have a certain shelf life, right? Then start a chemical reaction will start happening. Imagine the can, the tin can, is just like a chemical vessel and in an enclosed space. And the food items is just a medium that can have uh, that that where all the chemical reaction can happen. And once it cut, once it um, pass over the shelf life and expiry date, the all like what Louis just mentioned, the bacteria start having party because chemical reactions start to occur in the tin, and that causes gas to. Uh, to form within the enclosed space and that's what causes the bulge. What I don't understand is I've always thought metal that encloses a thing is 100% uh, covered, right? So there's no oxygen going in. The bacteria inside, you mean the, there is already bacteria inside the food? It hasn't died in the cooking. Okay. Um, yes. if, if you imagine a can, if you have seen ca um, cans industrial cans that uh, industrial drums that contain chemicals they are also sealed and there are no oxygen in it as well but when chemical reaction occur it basically will vaporize and form gaseous vapors that push up the cans so although there's no air within the sealed vessel because of the chemical reaction it will still form gas to make the the, the tin to bulge Okay, yeah. which brings me to the next question. So obviously, there's bacteria inside the cans already, right? Because otherwise, you, you don't have uh, parents, you don't have babies, right? So if the bacteria can multiply, it means there was bacteria already there. So when I buy canned food, is it safe to eat? <laughs> I think it is safe as long as within the shelf life. Um, I believe it is safe as long as it's taken within the before expiry date and the, ten, the can is not dented. Yeah. Why does that mean that the level of bacteria is still very low? It hasn't multiplied beyond an acceptable level. The, the food is safe without bacteria when it's produced. But during the, hand, uh, during the transportation or even after the shelf life, um, bacteria will start growing because of the fact that the food inside has already denatured and chemical reaction has already started. Yeah. The, the other thing we must remember is that our food is never sterile um, because the, we are not, uh, you know, whether we are talking about this table here, whether we are talking about our kitchens, no matter how many times we wipe it, it can be with different cloths each time, but it will never be sterile. Um, for that, you really need to go into a clean room. And even in the clean room where we manufacture drugs, it is also very, very difficult to be sterile. Um, so uh, no matter what, there will be some bacteria inside. Uh, and um, uh, fortunately, uh, evolution says that we, our bodies can handle the bacteria. Okay, now we... I, I want to change this subject to the elderly because I'm getting older, you see, so I, I'm more concerned. So a lot of uh, people have gastric problems. They take omeprazole, you know, uh, to stop. The, does that reduce the stomach's acidity and does that mean that people who are on omeprazole and other antacids are at higher risk of food poisoning? Uh, that is correct. So um, our stomach is very acid. Um, so actually when, I'm patient, when patients come and say that You know my stomach is very acid I'll tell them that actually your stomach is working correctly um, The pH in the stomach 
is one. It's very difficult to have pH of one. It's like going to the lab and coding up a, a, a bottle of pure sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid. This is pure acid that our stomach is producing. When we take things like omeprazole and other medicines to reduce acid, it, the pH from one to about somewhere between three to five. Now, anything that is less than a pH of less than seven is acidic. So your stomach is actually still acidic, but it means that it is not as acidic as before, and it means that it cannot kill as many bacteria as previously. So yes, you will be at slightly increased chance of getting. Food poisoning. So elderly people need to be a little bit more careful. So, el- so even elderly people who are not taking omeprazole, right. uh, what happens is just like any other part of the body, um, it, will be, it can become a bit more atrophic, and therefore, on its own, elderly people may already produce less yes. acid. Right. Anyone else with a question? Yes, the lady there. She's coming. With, she's coming with the microphone. The one in brown. Hi, good evening. Um, okay, so we heard about rodent disease, uh, lapotro- um, laposrosis. Okay, so uh, how safe are we when we have our own uh, domestic pet? Um, you know, yeah. So because domestic rodent pets, as in you, you have a rat for a pet? No, <laughs> no. Okay. Normal pets. Uh, yeah. I mean, right. we, uh, most of us have pets at home. So do they have the same problems? Is yes, what you're asking. That's right. Right. Do domestic pets have the same problem that rats cause in foods? No, no, no rats in hotels, okay. No, no rats in food chain. Oops, I don't think this is a question anybody here knows how to answer. Okay, I'm sure domestic pets have, uh, have, have the same, um, well, actually any animal potentially uh, can get some form of gastroenteritis. Um, but the only question is which, which bacterium or which virus will affect them? I don't think she means affects the pet. Does the pet, you know, if you have rats in supermarket and, and hawkers.